Welcome to the marketplace of ideas. Here, ideas of every description are attacked from every angle to test how well they stand up to rigorous scrutiny. The marketplace is necessarily brutal because its business is arguably the most important business of humankind, the business of determining reality, or the most reliable approximations to reality that we can muster. In order to do that, the marketplace needs to identify and eradicate false ideas grounded in deception, ignorance, or error. In this gladiatorial arena, it pays not to take too much for granted. Sometimes ideas that have enjoyed the favour of the crowds for centuries can be suddenly cut down by a new contender, just as the geocentric view of the universe in which the sun orbited the earth was vanquished by the heliocentric view. There can be no room for favouritism, because bad ideas breed. Say we take the harmless act of singing. We claim the human voice wasn't meant to sing. It was meant to talk and call and shout. We propose that singing is a decadent, immoral perversion. If we accept this idea without challenge or scrutiny, where might it take us? Well, first, it might simply discourage individuals from singing. But then it might enable another idea, that hearing other people sing corrupts our morals. After all, hearing others sing might make some folks think it's okay. This might enable the idea that we should stop other people singing, which in turn might enable further ideas about how to do that. Maybe gag them, maybe imprison them, maybe kill them. Left unchecked, bad ideas can take us down very destructive paths. That's why ideas need to be attacked forcefully, and ideally at their root. If the root idea is eliminated, its offshoots have nothing to draw on. It's not a blood sport, it's a truth sport. If flaws are detected, ideas can be eliminated or refined, so that what's left standing should represent progressively closer approximations to reality. But some ideas are left standing for other reasons. Some ideas have enjoyed the special privilege of immunity from criticism. For centuries, religions have relied on extreme fear tactics to crush all challenge. Folks proposing unorthodox changes to their religion, often to try and reform serious abuses, have been labelled heretics. Folks declining to respect the particular taboos of a religion, whether or not they're members of that religion, have been labelled blasphemers. And on charges of heresy and blasphemy, countless humans down the centuries have been shunned, imprisoned, censored, and killed. But many folks have grown sick of being intimidated into silence about the dehumanising prejudices and violations embedded in these protected religions. And, in many parts of the world, threats of punishment for blasphemy have lost their power. But in recent years, a new tactic has emerged to try and shut critics down, attempting to conflate the crucial business of attacking ideas with the reprehensible attacking of people. Instead of blasphemers, critics of religious ideologies have been collectively labelled prejudiced, racist, even phobic, insinuating that their objections necessarily stem from irrational fear rather than a sober consideration of the evidence. And it's been interesting to see how this tactical shift has been received in the marketplace of ideas. The marketplace has long championed ideas like prejudice is unfair and racism is unjust. And on that basis, for a while, it seemed the marketplace was hoodwinked by these recent imposters, these false definitions of prejudice and racism. But like the religious ideologies they're designed to protect, these fake accusations themselves are now coming under the scrutiny of the marketplace, and they're swiftly losing their punch. Watching this new wave of religion defending play out in the marketplace of ideas has a personal resonance for me. Years ago, I went through a similar period of religion defending in my own marketplace. We each possess our own exclusive marketplace, called a mind, where we privately assess the ideas that come our way, Compared to the public marketplace, which can draw on the vast experience and skills of many minds to attack ideas with maximum rigour, the internal marketplace is a distinctly inferior environment. Without other minds to compensate for our biases, our ignorance and other personal weaknesses, the end products of our internal marketplace are much more vulnerable to distortion. And it's because of distorting factors like these that for many years I defended a religion called Islam. In the spirit of transparency, I want to share some of the key events that shaped and reshaped my attitudes, including a childhood incident that coloured my outlook, a descent into fierce dissonance, and some experiences with a handful of wonderful Muslims and ex-Muslims who helped me dismantle my defences and look again at what I'd been defending.
One day, at the age of eight, I was out roller skating with my best friend, a boy from a Turkish family, who I'll call Bora. We'd been skating around the local streets when a wheel came loose on one of Bora's boots. By chance, we were near my grandparents' house, so I called on my grandfather to help fix it. While he looked at the roller skate, my grandmother took me to one side. In a tone of concern, she asked, Your friend isn't a Muslim, is he? I'd heard Bora use that word, but my Christian indoctrination only exposed me to the biblical religions. Christianity and Judaism. I'd heard about Buddhism, but only from watching a dubbed Japanese TV show called Monkey, in which a monkey king, along with a pig monster called Pigsy, and a swamp monster called Sandy, accompany a Buddhist monk, Tripitaka, on a pilgrimage to India. But Islam was nowhere on my radar. Bora was always teasing me in Turkish, so I assumed Muslim was just another Turkish word, and I was baffled to hear my grandmother using it. I asked her, how did you know? In response, she looked terrified and gripped my arm hard, telling me, Whatever you do, don't tell your grandfather. She said a Muslim killed his brother, and if he found out my friend was a Muslim, he might take his revenge. It was one of those hallucinatory moments where the world stops making sense. I looked back at Bora, joking around with my grandfather, unaware of any threat. It was nightmarish. My grandfather seemed to take ages to repair the roller skate. Every second, I feared my grandmother's question would occur to him. The moment the skate was fixed, I flustered a quick thanks and got Bora to race me down the road. After a few blocks, my panic subsided, but my disorientation remained. Punishing the innocent for other people's wrongdoings was common practice in the Bible. Children were cursed because of their parents' transgressions. Humankind was cursed because the first two humans disobeyed the Christian god, Yahweh. From the very start, this misdirected punishment had never made sense to me, but it seemed even more irrational in real life. What could my grandfather achieve by attacking Bora? He might as well attack a tree. I didn't know the word prejudice yet, but I knew what I'd just encountered felt ugly and alien. When we eventually stopped for a rest, Bora said what a nice man my grandfather was. I said nothing. I was desperate to know what Muslim meant, but I was afraid to ask anyone. Still thinking it was Turkish, I didn't bother with dictionaries, and this was years before the internet. Months later, when Bora spoke the word again, I saw my chance and asked him about it, and discovered there was another religion in the world. I became very protective of Bora, and, by extension, other Muslims. At age 11, I moved to secondary school, and finally got some religious education. Aside from teaching us about its rituals and festivals, our teacher taught us that Islam was the religion of peace and that its holy book, the Quran, promoted support for science. This ticked some great boxes. I imagined a religion full of friendly intellectuals. But in 1989, that image was shaken by news reports of an Iranian Muslim leader called Khomeini declaring a death sentence on author Salman Rushdie for an allegedly blasphemous novel called The Satanic Verses. At first, I dismissed it as a joke. Muslims wouldn't act like this. When I found out Khomeini's decree was genuine, I was stuck for an explanation. It was so medievally barbaric. I concluded Khomeini wasn't a real Muslim, just a demagogue trying to exploit Muslims for his own political gains. The news was awash with British Muslims burning the book and swearing they'd kill Rusty. I concluded these would-be assassins couldn't be genuine Muslims either and I hoped Islam would soon loudly reassert its true nature. As I started at university, the Rushdie affair had died down, and I'd lulled myself into believing peace was restored. Jamina and I arrived early on enrolment day and got talking. I was impressed to discover she'd already been credited in a published paper on the evolution of the human hand. As I got to know her, I found her to be a witty, open and warm individual. When she heard I liked to cook, she plied me with an endless stream of amazing recipes. One day, after finally reading her evolution paper, I mentioned the anti-evolution sentiment I'd experienced in Christianity, and I complimented Islam's commitment to science. With a candour that must have come easy in the face of my idealism, Jamina gingerly corrected some of my misconceptions. There was no core commitment to science in Islam. In fact, there was extreme resistance to any science that conflicted with Islamic teaching. Regarding evolution, she said Muslims held a range of views. Some considered it blasphemous. Others had no problem with it as long as humans were excluded. Others endorsed divinely guided evolution. 
but she knew very few Muslims who shared her acceptance of natural human evolution. Even within her own family, she'd had to limit who she told about her evolution paper. It was a great disappointment to hear all the same resistances I'd heard in my old Christian community. I started to pay closer attention to actual Muslim attitudes to science, and realised my religious education teacher's mistake. The claim wasn't that the Quran was a supporter of science, but that it was supported by science i.e. that the ideas in this 1400-year-old book were substantiated by modern scientific findings. Among the examples I heard was a claim that science showed that mountains keep the land in place, supporting Quran passages in which Allah set down mountains like pegs to stop the land shaking. Of course, what science actually showed was that far from being pre-existing pegs that stop land movement, Mountains were the product of ongoing land movement, formed by the collision of the Earth's slowly moving plates. Earthquakes, literally land shakes, were an even more obvious falsification of the claim. Unscientific holy books were nothing new to me. I'd long been aware of similar flaws in the Bible. For instance, Yahweh's depicted creating plants before creating the sun. So life forms that relied on photosynthesis had no photo to synthesize. But it was Jemina's comment about Muslim attitudes towards evolution that stayed with me and raised some unsettling thoughts. Not always, but sometimes. A rejection of evolution was associated with bogus ideas about what humans are designed for. I'd experienced aggressive outbursts about evolution from some Church of England Christians and Jehovah's Witnesses, and it was no coincidence that these same folks had extremely fixed views on issues like gender and sexuality. They believed their god Yahweh designed women as subordinates to men and designed humans to be exclusively heterosexual. I realised if Islam promoted these kinds of fixed gender and sexual roles, that could spell big trouble. The Quran was claimed to be the perfect word of a god, conveyed verbatim by an angel. Much harder to face the possibility of human error if you believe your scriptures dictated by a god instead of merely inspired by one. But, just as it did with the Rushdie affair, the phrase religion of peace eased my concerns. Within weeks of meeting Jemina, I met Perinda. We enrolled as volunteers at the same charity and quickly became pals. One day, the subject of partners came up and Perinda revealed she was divorcing her husband. She said it was an extremely complicated business. I asked why she was divorcing him. After a long pause, she said, domestic abuse. Then it was like watching a dam burst. The whole story gushed out of her. For years he'd beaten her, always careful to target parts of her that couldn't be seen and never leave permanent marks. When she told her parents, they'd sided with him, suspecting her of being a rebellious wife. In desperation, she'd thrown herself down some concrete stairs, breaking several bones. She hadn't cared whether she'd be hospitalised or die. She just didn't want to spend every moment in fear. It was only when they saw her in hospital that her parents finally changed their attitude and supported her divorce. I couldn't imagine defending someone who beat my child. Prinda said it wasn't their fault, it was what their religion taught them. She said Islam instructed husbands to beat rebellious wives. It even warned women that the angels cursed wives who refused their husbands sexual demands. I didn't believe Islam would promote such dehumanising values. Privately, I figured Prinda was taking scripture out of context but the abuse and lack of support she'd suffered was horrifying, and I was relieved it was over. A couple of weeks later, Perinda arrived in a clearly agitated state. We went outside for a private chat, and I asked what was up. She said her brother's son had come out to her as gay. It was unlike her to have an issue with sexuality. I asked what the problem was. She said she was afraid for him. I said I was sure he'd be okay. Folks were more enlightened these days. She said I didn't understand. If her brother found out, he'd take his son back to India and bury him alive. I had to check I hadn't misheard. She confirmed I hadn't. Even as an empty threat, the idea was unthinkably wicked. But Perinda clearly took it seriously. I said Islam must condemn such violence. She said Islam was the source of these murderous ideas. In a conspiratorial whisper, she told me Islam wasn't what I thought it was. She said the Muslims in her community wanted outsiders to think they embraced values like freedom and equality, but they really didn't. So, fixed gender and sexual roles, both of which I predicted would be especially disastrous within Islam, 
had now been presented as part of Islamic doctrine. I could have responded to this information by picking up a Quran or investigating the Hadith, the multi-authored reports of the life of Muhammad written and collected years after his death. But I simply didn't feel the need. A religion of peace would never sanction wife-beating and murder. I figured Perinda was making up stories to try and excuse her parents' betrayal and her brother's pathological homophobia. It was understandable. They were family. Of course she'd want to pretend they weren't responsible for their hateful ideas. But I couldn't support her delusions. And in the following weeks, whenever she criticised Islam, I stayed silent. She soon got the message and dropped the subject. On her final day, I barely recognised the woman who walked in. No hijab, just an elegant trouser suit. I said, you look different. She said she realised criticising her community in secret achieved nothing. She wanted to align herself, visibly, with the values of freedom and equality she held dear. Disapproving comments had already been conveyed to her parents in the last week from folks who'd seen her on the street, but she didn't mind. She said it might spark some useful discussion. After she'd said her goodbyes to everyone else, I went outside with her. She said she loved my faith in people, and she hoped they didn't disappoint me. She gave me a tearful hug and drove away. I met Oz on a one-day workshop in existential therapy. The day began with an ice-breaking exercise in which we stood in a circle and someone would step into the centre and share a personal characteristic that wasn't visibly obvious. Everyone who shared that characteristic would join the person in the centre. Then we'd resume our positions and someone else would have a go. In one of my turns, I stepped in and said, I'm an atheist. Among the folks who joined me in the centre was Oz. When he returned to the wider circle, he had an irrepressible grin. Over the morning, we paired up as exercise partners, and when lunchtime came, I invited him to a local cafe, where we had a spell-breaking conversation. He told me that was his first confession of atheism, and he was still buzzing. I asked him about his path out of Islam. He asked if I'd heard of the satanic verses. He'd been a teenager during the Rusty incident. He'd seen his fellow Muslims' anger and resentment about the book. They'd approached the publishers, even the police, to stop its circulation, but no action was taken, so they took to the streets. Oz said the London demonstrations were exhilarating, and afterwards there was a sense of relief and vindication when the protest dominated the news, sending the message, we exist. But his mood changed when he saw the concerned reactions of non-Muslims. People spoke of living among a religion full of mindless assassins. Neighbours they'd befriended were backing off. Even his classmates were asking if he wanted to kill Rusty. Publicly, he denounced these reactions as ignorant and prejudiced. But privately, he knew he and his family had felt great pride when news reports showed British Muslims vowing to kill Rusty. He realised he couldn't have it both ways, wanting Rusty dead, but crying prejudice when correctly suspected of wanting Rusty dead. To sort out his position, he did what neither Khomeini or anyone in Oz's community had done. He read the book. He obtained a copy, which he read in secret. But instead of gratuitous scandal, he found a witty, insightful novel that magically voiced many of his own feelings about identity and belonging, and underscored the need to question what we're told. Oz realised he'd been deceived about Rushdie, and that he and his fellow Muslims had allowed themselves to be whipped up by their leaders into a completely false sense of victimhood. He made subtle hints to his family about reading the book but soon realised that they were impervious to reason or evidence. Vowing he'd never be like that, he began questioning his own firmly held beliefs. Before long, he was an atheist, exploring humanist ideas. Oz's story aroused a deep anxiety in me. As we headed back to the existential therapy workshop, I asked him if he thought he'd ever come out to his family. He said his parents' country executed people for leaving Islam, and they supported that penalty. He wryly noted the double standard of Muslims who demanded acknowledgement for their own existence, while privately wishing to end the existence of others. For me, this was the tipping point. The tutor began the afternoon session with a talk about the loss of meaning, which was exactly what I was experiencing. It was a familiar hallucinatory feeling, a feeling that the world suddenly made no sense. Out of nowhere, the roller skate incident with Bora bubbled up in my mind. 
I hadn't thought of it for years. I remembered my eight-year-old self rooted to the spot, terrified for my best friend. And I realised that in my eagerness to defend him, I'd given Islam a completely free pass. Defending an innocent friend from a perceived threat made sense. Defending an ideology I'd never scrutinised was absurd. The free pass was revoked. Recalling the roller skate incident with a clear head led me to revoke something else. I realised that, till the day he died, I'd never once heard my grandfather express any anti-Muslim feeling. I'd found him guilty of murderous prejudice based purely on my grandmother's fears. I now corrected that verdict to not guilty. When the workshop ended, I thanked Oz for sharing his story with me. From that day, over ten years ago, I began to unravel the mess I'd got myself into over Islam. That process of unravelling underscored a number of ideas. Idea 1. Distorted ideas backfire. When we set out to defend something, whether it's a group of people, an ideology, or a principle, it's crucial to have an accurate understanding of that thing, or we could end up actively opposing the very thing we think we're fighting for. In striving for a distorted idea of freedom, one that only grants freedom to those we agree with, we could end up opposing freedom, becoming authoritarian, controlling, even totalistic. In striving for a distorted idea of equality, one that denies natural variations in preferences between groups, we could end up advocating gross inequalities. In striving to support Muslims, I ended up denying support to Perinda because of my distorted idea of Muslims. The roller skate incident and my one-sided religious education led me to define Muslims in a very narrow way as peaceful and vulnerable. To some folks, that might sound like a positive image to have of Muslims, one that should inspire protectiveness towards them. But it inspired denial. Khomeini was violent and oppressive, but because that contradicted my idea of Muslims, I denied that he or his followers were real Muslims. When Jamina revealed Muslims had no intrinsic commitment to science, I was able to accept that. Disappointing as it was, it didn't contradict their peaceful, vulnerable image. But when Perinda linked the oppressive views of her husband and family to Islam, my denial returned. These values had to be down to personal flaws that had nothing to do with Islam. This meant Perinda was not credible. So, paradoxically, viewing Muslims as peaceful and vulnerable was what caused me to disbelieve a peaceful, vulnerable Muslim. Ironically, if I'd taken the opposite distorted view, defining Muslims as oppressive and violent, I could have accepted Purinda's story. I say ironically because I wouldn't have got to hear it. Viewing her as an oppressive Muslim too, I wouldn't have befriended her. So, Purinda loses either way. These are the ironies and paradoxes that can arise when we define any broad group in a distorted way. Viewing people as exclusively virtuous or exclusively wicked is called splitting, because we split off the parts we don't want to acknowledge. When we demonise people, we split off the positive parts. When we canonise people, we split off the negative. A warning sign that we've demonised people is that nothing they do, however positive, is good enough. They can perform great acts of charity and philanthropy. We'll find ways of dismissing them as fake and self-serving. Demonised people are guilty until proven guilty. Conversely, a warning sign that we've canonised people is that nothing they do, however negative, is bad enough. They can commit all kinds of slanders and attacks. We'll find ways of excusing every transgression. Canonised people are innocent until proven innocent. The solution to splitting is to recognise that people aren't all good or all bad, but simply human, capable of the full range of human traits. When I started seeing Muslims as human, instead of martyrs, I was able to admit all the reality I'd previously denied. Khomeini and his followers were real Muslims. The values of Purinda's husband and family did have something to do with Islam. And Purinda was credible and deserved support. This leads to idea two. Ideas are everything. For many years, I deluded myself that religious education at school had given me a pretty rounded knowledge of Islam. Those classes certainly taught me swathes of jargon. Rakat, Zakat, Hajj, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, Muezzin, Quran, Hadith, Sirah. I wrote countless essays explaining these and other terms, 
comparing them with elements in other religions, comparing religious festivals, religious fasting practices, religious buildings, and so on. What was missing from those classes? The actual ideas promoted by these religions, the social values, the politics, the foundational beliefs, the stuff that mattered. These vacuous classes gave the impression that religions were interchangeable, that the underlying beliefs were basically the same. They just had different festivals, books and buildings. But religions aren't interchangeable. They promote vastly different ideas, shaping human lives in vastly different ways. Heaven's Gate was a UFO religion, whose founder, Marshall Applewhite, taught his followers to gradually disown their physical bodies, which were referred to as vehicles, making them seem temporary and disposable. Members were even encouraged to undergo castration to eliminate their sexuality. Eventually, we saw the results of this grooming. Almost 20 years ago to the day, Applewhite persuaded the group to commit mass suicide by ingesting phenobarbital, having told them their spirits would be picked up by a spaceship trailing the Hale-Bopp comet and transferred into a next-level body. Now, imagine if Heaven's Gate had succeeded in becoming a major world religion, gaining hundreds of millions of followers worldwide, with huge groups of them intermittently committing suicide every time a comet passed by the Earth. Would you be happy for this religion to be presented to your children as no better or worse than all the other religions? Would you be happy for them to learn its jargon, like vehicle and next-level body, without any critical discussion of its core ideas? More to the point, would having concerns about this religion mean you were suffering from an irrational fear called heaven's gateophobia? When it comes to religion, ideas are everything. If we don't know the ideas, we don't know the religion. To gauge the ideas of a religion, we need to see how it's lived. Simply reading the ideas in its holy scripture doesn't necessarily do that. Among those condemned to death in the Jewish Torah are Sabbath breakers. But we don't see endless reports of modern Jews killing people for working on the Sabbath. The Jewish judicial body that enforced these laws, known as the Sanhedrin, was dissolved centuries ago. If it was re-established, things might look very different. Unlike Judaism, Islam has a very active religious judicial system called Sharia, which informs the official laws of several countries and which some hope to see implemented in other countries. That gives Islam a unique political leverage to impose its scriptural ideas on people. And all the oppressive ideas conveyed by Parinda and Oz have found support. In 2016, Pakistan's Council for Islamic Ideology supported wife-beating for a range of offences, including refusing sex without a religious excuse, not wearing a hijab, and talking to strangers. This is based on Surah 4 verse 34 of the Quran, a verse expressing ideas that should have long ago died away, but are still widely perpetuated and defended. Homosexuals are sentenced to death in honour killings and official executions. One Muslim cleric, speaking at a US university in 2013, called it an act of compassion. He later clarified this, explaining that killing homosexuals was in their best interests, because they'd sin less. And Oz was right about Islam's death penalty for leaving Islam, which is implemented in accordance with Sharia. We sometimes judge complex systems like religions on woefully inadequate evidence. If the only Muslims we knew were peaceful, kind and liberated, we might use them as the basis for our perception of Islam. Conversely, if we read some of the violent, supremacist passages contained in Islamic scripture, we might assume all Muslims support those ideas. Getting to know a religion is about seeing how its ideas shape the lives it touches. This leads to idea three, splitting breeds polarisation. When we start loudly promoting an all-good or all-bad image of any broad social group, we'll often find other voices spring up, loudly promoting the opposite view. The all-bad group, unable to see the good, is mystified by the all-good group's obvious denial and presses its own position harder. But the all-good group, unable to see the bad, is equally mystified by the all-bad group's obvious denial and does the same. Focusing on each other's denial, both groups push each other to greater extremes of polarisation. The all-good group blocks progress by denying all problems. The all-bad group blocks progress by denying all hope. To resolve the deadlock, both groups need to recognise their own denial and acknowledge the problems and the hope. Let me outline some of those problematic and hopeful areas. 
There are Muslims who despise secularism and Muslims who support it. There are Muslims who reject criticism and Muslims who welcome it. There are Muslims who want to push the whole world back to 7th century Islam and Muslims who want to drag Islam into the 21st century world. There are Muslims who respond violently to cartoons and Muslims who brush them off. There are Muslims who try to deflect legitimate criticism of Islam with double talk and Muslims who condemn this double talk and work to expose it. We don't have to respond to the voices we disagree with by pretending they don't exist or pretending they're not real Muslims. We can just disagree with them and support the voices more aligned with our values. Which leads to idea four, allow all voices. It's the essential spirit of the marketplace of ideas. Allow all voices to be heard and let the ideas they promote be scrutinized. Let any deceptions and evasions be uncovered. Let any oppressive agendas be exposed. For this to happen, we need a level playing field. But for centuries, one side has been systematically silenced. For many non-Muslims, the Salman Rushdie fatwa was the first indication of the price paid by Muslims and ex-Muslims who are perceived in any way to be critical of Islam. Another indication came in 2004, when Ian Hersey Ali and Theo Van Gogh made a film called Submission, criticising the oppression of Muslim women. Van Gogh was assassinated, with a death threat to Hersey Ali pinned to his body with a knife. We see the same pattern in the emancipation of so many oppressed groups. The first critical voices are dealt with brutally to discourage further resistance, but the balance can shift when enough voices emerge and spread the risk. More critical Muslim and ex-Muslim voices are slowly finding greater prominence, but still being subjected to attack. Raheel Raza received death threats after leading a mixed gender congregation in prayer. In what's been described as a Rosa Parks-style act of civil disobedience, Azra Nomani entered a West Virginia mosque through the men's door and refused to move from the men's section during prayers. Nomani and her parents were subsequently threatened with death. When former London imam Usama Hassan expressed public support for the theory of evolution, an online leaflet appeared and was later distributed at his mosque, charging Hassan with disbelief and quoting rulings of execution in similar cases. Majid Nawaz has made a habit of inviting his fellow Muslims to join him in condemning punishments like dismemberment for theft and the stoning to death of adulterers. Those he invites persistently decline to do so. Opponents of Nawaz have incited international assassination threats. Death threats are the norm for Muslims and ex-Muslims who dare to criticise Islam. They take risks some of us would find unthinkable to highlight real problems rooted in Islamic scripture that are much more common than some of us would like to imagine. Some of their stories might be difficult and painful to listen to, but the stories of future generations could be a lot more painful if we don't start listening. Which leads to idea five, reassessing a cliche. In a 2015 interview with CNN's Farid Zakaria, Barack Obama said it's very important for us to align ourselves with the 99.9% .9 of Muslims who are looking for the same things we are. Order, peace, prosperity. When referring to peaceful Muslims, this figure of 99.9% .9 is so commonplace it's become a cliche, a reflex soundbite uncritically accepted as truth. Let's look at this figure in relation to two specific practices promoted within Islam. The stoning to death of adulterers and the execution of apostates. Two questions. First, what percentage of Muslims do you think support these practices? Second, at what percentage level would you personally start having serious concerns? Between 2010 and 2013, the Pew Research Center polled 37 territories with significant Muslim populations to gauge their opinions on these practices. These 37 territories account for 60% of the total global population of Muslims. Support for stoning adulterers ranged from 6% to 86%. Support for killing apostates ranged from 1% to 88%. Taking the average of these percentages alone, 40% of Muslims wanted adulterers buried to their shoulders and pelted with rocks until they're dead, and 31% wanted people killed for leaving Islam. Seeing this figure of 31%, reminded me of a BBC online report from the mid-2000s, also reporting 31% support for killing apostates, this time among British Muslims. 
Support in the 16 to 34 age range was especially high, at up to 37%, more than one in three. Clearly, a majority of Muslims don't support these barbaric practices, but 99.9% is a daydream from which we need to wake up. And if younger generations are showing greater support for these practices, that could point to a growing problem, not a shrinking one. Islam is not monolithic. Reportedly, Muhammad predicted there would be 73 sects of Islam. In a claim not all Muslims accept, all but one is said to be destined for hellfire. The main divide is between Sunni and Shia branches, which favour different successors to Muhammad. Both have given rise to subgroups, but while the Shia branch recognises one school of Sharia, the Sunni branch recognises a handful of schools, favoured by different movements. The Ahmadi branch proclaims love for all, hatred for none. Ahmadi Muslims believe a messianic reformer was born in the 1800s, sent to end religious wars, condemn bloodshed, and reinstitute morality, justice, and peace. The Ahmadi community has been denounced as non-Muslim and aggressively persecuted. In Pakistan, Ahmadi residents have reportedly been required to disown their prophet to obtain a Muslim passport, and hundreds from their community have been murdered in various mob attacks and full-scale massacres. The campaign of persecution has followed them to the UK, including death threats, the targeted boycotting of Ahmadi businesses, and even protests to block permission for an Ahmadi mosque, all by other Muslim groups. Also worth a mention are the Sufis and the Quranists. Quranists reject the Hadith, taking the Quran as their sole text. Reports of their persecution include mass arrests in Sudan on charges of apostasy, where execution is threatened for the wrong type of Islam. The Sufis are a mystical Islamic order, emphasizing inner experience, ritual, and worship. Sufis have been accused of idolatry and religious innovation, and their persecution has ranged from the banning of devotional gatherings in Egypt, to the systematic destruction of Sufi shrines in Timbuktu, to the murder of hundreds of Sufis in Pakistan. It's plain to see, just as no Christian speaks for all Christians, no Muslim speaks for all Muslims. It's also tempting to fall into splitting again, thinking of these groups as all good or all bad. Again, the truth is more complex. For example, while the Ahmadi community proclaims love for all, hatred for none, in its commentary on the Quran, we find support for the idea that there can be no true friendship between believers and disbelievers, an idea it claims has general application, as well as being specially true in times of war. The Reason on Faith website has also contrasted regressive Ahmadi views on homosexuality with the more welcoming views of groups like Muslims for Progressive Values. What's abundantly clear in all this conflict is that the people who suffer most under Islam are Muslims. If we care about that suffering, we need to acknowledge the part Islam plays in it. Ravi got in touch with me in 2013 to ask about the meanings of certain phrases in my videos. He said he was an atheist and wanted to translate them for some people. I explained the phrases and asked who he was sharing it with. He explained that he and a small group of trusted friends lived in a state where the penalty for apostasy was death, each of them pretending to be a Muslim in public life while privately leading a secular existence. Ravi and his friends gathered atheist materials from online sources to discuss with each other and develop their critical thinking skills. He said these forbidden materials were like candles, illuminating the darkness around them and giving them hope that one day they might step out into the light. Ravi lives in constant fear of discovery, and his fears are well-founded. In 2016, under Sharia, Afghan citizen Abdul Rahman was sentenced to death for converting to Christianity. He was eventually granted asylum by Italy after Afghan President Hamid Karzai became caught between pressure from the West to release him and pressure from the Afghan public to execute him. Rahman's trial judge commented, The Prophet Muhammad has said several times that those who convert from Islam should be killed if they refuse to come back. He added, Islam is a religion of peace, tolerance, kindness, and integrity. That is why we have told him, if he regrets what he did, then we will forgive him. So, this is the measure of peace. Think what we tell you to think, and we won't kill you. Miriam Ibrahim was eight months pregnant when she was sentenced to death for refusing to renounce Christianity. 
She identified as a Christian, following her mother's religion, but with her father being a Muslim, she was expected to take up his faith. Thanks to an Amnesty International petition that gained more than a million signatures, the Sudanese authorities released her, exiling her and her family to the US. So, are critics of Islam suffering from an irrational fear called Islamophobia? Or do they have a point? Religious ideologies aren't interchangeable. They promote vastly different ideas, shaping human lives in vastly different ways. What follows from that is that some religions will attract more negative attention than others. Ideologies that degrade and dehumanize people, that promote violence and threaten death, should expect more criticism than ideologies that don't. They're not being picked on for arbitrary prejudicial reasons. They're being held to account for the abuse they inspire. Religious ideas are not untouchable. They deserve no privilege. On the contrary, they deserve rigorous and long overdue criticism to catch up on centuries of silencing criticism through shunning, imprisonment, censorship and killing. I don't measure an ideology's peacefulness by its willingness not to kill people so long as they surrender to it. The implicit threat behind that idea destroys any pretense of peacefulness. People come first. And when ideas threaten people, it only provides further support for the essential human activity of attacking ideas. Thank you.